talking about them, but I'm great. And I've, <laughs> I've been looking forward to this interview for weeks, so. though. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not a, a disappointment. <laughs> Go ahead, Dana. Sorry, I couldn't get it to work. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, the Underground is such a beautiful story, both visually and on the page, the words. I was wondering, what was it about this script and just about the project in general? There's been a lot of, you know, we've seen the slavery shows and we've seen the movies. What was it that you truly felt that separated this from others? No, it's one of the things, like, I count myself as, you know, being such a blessed individual to be able to collaborate um, with a director like Barry Jenkins. And one of the things that I know about Barry is whenever he takes on a project, he's going to present it in a way that feels not only authentic, but it feels inventive and like a new perspective. And so one of the things that made me excited about the Underground Railroad is in reading the book, I could see how visually this was going to translate to the screen. And I was excited about being a part of not only this collaboration, but presenting the series to the world in a way we're not only depicting slavery, but the, its effects mentally and physically, you know, on the black community. And it was to me a necessity to tell the story because we can't forget where we came from, but present it in a way with honor and dignity that we're proud of the struggle and, you know, and the journey that brought us here today. Hey, Joy, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for, talking, for talking to us. Uh, I'm Jamal Michelle with the Nerds of Color. Um, I first just wanted to really, really thank you for, uh, for the work you and that did on Moonlight. Uh, I, told Barry, I talked Barry's ear off when we got to speak to him that Moonlight, as a young writer from, uh, from Miami, Moonlight is still the most gorgeous piece of, of anything that, that I've seen in a really long time. So uh, yeah, so I, I told my wife, um, I, I was going to talk to her off too about that. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, you, you had mentioned one of your, your earlier interviews that you had never done a show um, that was 10 episodes long or that was for a streaming service. And I was just curious, what was the, pro the, the process like balancing each character's narrative for a work of this size and yeah, you know, it's interesting working on a series of this magnitude. I think it was one of the things that we really, really, really wanted to focus on was Cora's journey. And, you know, Tuso, our lead, did such an amazing job of not only bringing this character to, a, character to life, but adding texture um, to this character and the different layers that are supposed to be, you know, um, in Cora, she definitely brought to the forefront and it's one of the things that you know I definitely give uh, Colson and Barry credit for is presenting this female character that's fully formed you know she's such a nuanced individual that has the layers of being you know a little selfish but vulnerable and guarded and also courageous and fearless and I think there's um, the way that Tuso brought that character to life there's such an authenticity into her performance that you as an audience member are not only drawn in, but you're invested in this journey that she's about to embark on. And so, you know, doing the series, you know, in 10 episodes, one of the things, you know, we had to pay attention to was how each episode fitted into the storyline, but also making sure that, you know, when you get to that final episode with Mabel, she's been, you know, woven throughout the series that there is a payoff when you finally get to the finale. Um, and that was one of the things that, you know, that Mabel episode definitely influenced the rest of the episodes and made us realize, oh, we should bring in Mabel during these flashbacks. That wasn't originally written in the script. It was something that informed us later on that, oh, you know, bringing Mabel in, allowing Cora to have these flashbacks and these thoughts of her mother allows us, you know, to present the audience with the importance of not only Mabel, but Mabel's effect that she's had on Cora and who she is, you know, throughout the novel, or sorry, the series. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jonita, Jonita Davis from the Black Cape. Um, I, I've, I've noticed this, um, I don't want to even say trend, I want to say pattern, in um, stories, historic stories, our stories that are done by our, you know, directors and um, with creatives and stuff that are, you know, that are us, the Black, you know, creatives, um, where 
we don't see, we don't get much, as much as a visual of the of the pain, yeah. but we get it, the emotional, sensual, you know, that, that we hear it, we see it in the faces of everybody. We don't necessarily see it um, in the bodies. And I was, I was wondering, um, first, is that like an editing decision or a directing thing? Or is it like a, like a combination of both? Where does that come from? And do you think that's something that'll change the way, you know, even with white creators that, you know, black, our history is depicted on screen where we're not seeing that visceral, you know, violence, but feeling it? Yeah, you know, it's one of the things that, um, you know, Barry is such a unique storyteller. And I think he is one of the most observant people that I've had the pleasure of working with. And so he's pro he's taking everything in and he's processing it as he starts to tell the story. And, you know, one of the things that, like, I feel like the audience felt very connected and, and emotionally invested with Cora are, were these okra seeds. You know, and, and these okra seeds took on a, a whole nother storyline and a whole nother representation of not only um, carrying your past with you, but knowing when it's time to let it go. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we did with the violence is that it, it existed, but sometimes it's even more heightened by not showing it to you, by allowing you to see the experience on other people's reactions. Um, or, you know, bringing it back in the flashback. And one of the things that I thought was so, um, a, a brilliant example of seeing the effect of something physically happening to people or to someone is um, in that scene when Cora and Royal connect for the first time and you see the scars on her back. And it's, you know, it's one of the things that Mingo said, you know, um, or Mr. Mr. Valentine says that, you know, the scars of slavery will never fade. And, you know, I think a lot of people want to be dismissive of where we come from and don't want to talk about it, but it's like, we're still representations of what happened, you know, like to erase that is trying to erase us. And so we have to be mindful of the things that we say, because it does have an effect on generations to come. So saying that we don't need to talk about slavery, you're saying like, do we not need to talk about where we come from? And that we do, you know, to acknowledge it gives you the ability to move on, to not acknowledge it. You know, your whole, your, your, like Ridgeway says, you got to release that anger, it'll, it'll eat you alive. And so, you know, in presenting the series to the world, we are, you know, it's a cathartic process of releasing this into the world and saying, we don't, we, not only do we know it happened, but we're presenting it to a way where you can't forget it as well. And we're, we're building a foundation that we can, you know, move on to the future. Thank you. Thank you oh, so you're much. You're so welcome. Uh, Dana Abercrombie from the Coalition again. Uh, like I was saying before, this is visually very beautiful. And what I love is how it pairs greatly with kind of the music as well. Can you talk about a little bit of the inspiration between mirroring both the visuals along with the sound? Yes. You know, um, in film school, uh, the film school that Barry and I attended, our um, sound professor was Richard Portman, who was, um, a, a, you know, a fantastic uh, re-recording mixer. He did Deer Hunter, he worked on Rocky, um, and he always ingrained in us that, you know, film is 50% picture and 50% sound. Um, and from the beginning, you know, whenever Barry and I um, have collaborated, we have, you know, focused very heavily on sound. And I feel like for me, you know, working on that, that scene with Dick Anthony in the edit, I, you know, tried to put a blueprint for what the sound design was gonna be like, but once Anna Lee, our sound um, supervisor and re-recording mixer, Matt Waters got involved, they just took that scene to a whole nother level. And that's one of the things, the soundscape that we're working with um, we're definitely, you know, in there with our um, re-recording mixers and developing it. And one of the things I love about collaborating with people that, you know, we've had, we've built this trust and this great rapport that, you know, Anna Lee is talking to Nicholas Bertel, our composer, and discussing like, you know, I'm thinking about adding this anvil sound in the intro of Bridgeway. And Nick is like, oh, that's great. Well, then the score, I'll be in this key so it matches. And so the reason why everything feels so cohesive is because we're all having conversations about the process and how best way, um, 
how best to present the series. Thank you. It was beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, so you spoke about having to work um, on the beginning and the end of the series at the same time. As a writer, I think that would drive me nuts. I, I really <laughs> love endings, but I, I, I would be so uh, just flummoxed by the task of, of making sure I didn't jump the gun or reveal too much or too little. Uh, but what, what kind of challenges presented themselves in ways that were different from ones you might have encountered with like feature length films? You know, one of the things that we arrived at um, by, you know, I actually went down to Atlanta while Barry was still shooting to work on the opening of chapter one. And one of the things that we kind of wanted to make sure we dialed in, um, but didn't give too much away for the images in the opening. And so we wanted to, of course, pique the audience interest and in like, oh, this world is gonna be so much more than just being on a plantation. Um, because I, that was our fear with chapter one is that people would see plantation and be like, oh, you know, but it's like, no, 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 this is jumping off point. Get on the train with Cora. <laughs> you know, you'll be happy you did. Um, and so that was one of the things that we really focused on in the opening was putting these images that drew you in that was like, oh, I want to go on this journey. I want to discover, you know, where she um, ends up. And that was one of the things that like throughout working on the different episodes, we kind of selected these moments that we knew that we should feature throughout, you know, Caesar running backwards, Royal, like, you know, all, you know, because basically these images are supposed to be represent representative of what's going through Cora's mind as she's falling down the shaft. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you, sp you spoke of uh, the sound. One of the things that I found so profound about the series was the silence. The, there was so much done in silence. Um, I want to know, how did you balance, you know, that the silence, getting enough meaning out of it without having it go too far? Because the silence, I mean, there, there's a part, I mean, when she's hiding, there's a part where she's like just in the, the, the tunnel by herself. And I remember the ending um was mostly silence from what i remember but it was still so much in there yeah how did you get how do you straddle that line of just enough and oh this is way too much and you know <laughs> somebody say something <laughs> <laughs> you know it's one of those things is you know as i'm as we're working on the edit um we definitely don't want to take it past the point where, you know, the audience becomes disengaged. And so it's a fine line of balance between like, where, when do you have dialogue and when do you let things um, happen naturally in silence? And I feel like when you take out dialogue, it kind of enhances the viewer. Like, you know, you're kind of leaning in when there's nothing to hear and you're kind of like, okay, where are we going? Like, and it almost gives you, makes you a little anxious when there's no dialogue because then you're preparing yourself for something. And, you know, um, I think we took those moments and we placed them very carefully throughout the series and the soundscape that we, you know, um, that they designed and we created this atmosphere that these silent moments had this intent and purpose behind it. So you as an audience feel like, oh, I get why this is happening this way. Oh, I definitely got it. And then there was one point <laughs> where I didn't want to move. Because <laughs> I didn't want Court to get caught. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was, I was telling Barry, I was like, if I didn't know what was gonna happen, I'd be on the edge of my seat right now, being like, where is she? Where is she going? <laughs> So I'm happy it worked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Dana Abercrombie, The Coalition again. Um, I was wondering, because this is an adaptation, and also you worked on um, If Bill Street Could Talk, and that was an adaptation as well. But I was wondering for this one, what kind of cues do you take from the original source, the book? And when is it, do you go on your own and come up with your own? Because I know that when you're reading, you get certain ideas, either visual or just from the feeling of it as well. So I was wondering, does that come into play? Yes, it does. You know, one of the things that Barry talks about, you know, doing an adaptation with 
you know, an author who's, you know, passed away and doing an adaptation of an author who's living. And he was like, it's somewhere in the middle, you know, like having that freedom, but also wanting to honor um, the text. And so one of the things I thought that was really cool, what Barry did was um, the character Jasper in uh, Tennessee Exodus. Um, in the novel, Jasper is, doesn't have um, that big of a role. And um, Barry really leans into that character and what he represented. Um, and so, you know, initially Tennessee was one episode. And um, I think one of the things that while we got into the edit, Barry was like, oh, Tennessee should be two episodes. And I think, you know, giving Jasper that space to really infiltrate the series and really highlight, you know, some of the choices that people did make back then, you know, of, you know, not eating and being able to finally be free, you know, um, it was one of the things that like, I can't imagine Jasper being sandwiched in, in between, you know, one long episode, like giving him that room to really, ex the audience to really experience, ja experience Jasper and, um, you know, his, you know, interaction with Cora to me was something that we found in the edit and I think really did um, a service to not only the novel, but the series in itself. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we're coming up on the end here, but I just wanted to know real quick, um, you know, going through your, your film program, there are insights that you learn, and then you take up your first major project, there are further insights. What were some new insights for you that you gained from working on this series? Um, even having been with folks that you you established a relationship with for so long, what are some new things you took away from this? You know, I think one of the things that um, I feel like both Barry and I, or probably the whole crew, have realized is that um, the sustainability of the of basically the creative mind. You know, like in I feel like if someone told me how long and how hard this would have been, I'd be like, I can't do it, you know? It's like when you're working with your trainer and they're like, one more push-up, and you're like, I can't. <laughs> I can't do one more push-up. Right. Right. You know, definitely Indiana Winter, I was at a point where I was like, I can't do one more push-up. That was like our last episode that Barry and I worked on together. Um, but understanding um, not only the necessity to tell the story, but to get it right, um, was one of the things that definitely kept us going and definitely kept us encouraging each other. And I think the thing that I realized about myself was that I do have it in me to not only do it, but do it well. Um, and, you know, I think tackling 10 episodes in, and cutting five of the 10, um, I think a lot of people were like, it was just you and one other editor. And I'm like, it was just us. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, some people would be like, you need a team of five to tackle this. But um, we were able to accomplish it. But also we did it together because we had the trust and the support of one another and understanding that, you know, what we're taking on is something that not only does the world need to watch, but it's something that we hope, of, um, you know, the experience is something that, is of value. You know, one thing that I always say is that the, the commodity that sometimes people don't realize is of the highest value is time. It's not something that you can get back. And so us as artists, when we create something, we want it, we want it to be worth your time. And um, that's one of the things that we hope that the series is something that not only stays with you, but something that you may want to revisit later in life because of not only its importance, but its impact on um, one another. Thank you so much. Every minute was worth it, of course. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, I've got the last question, and um, I, I know they told you it was going to be about Zola. Um, <laughs> I saw it. I loved it. Couldn't oh, believe that okay. Sundance had it, um, which, I mean, groundbreaking for me, because to me, it's like, okay, y'all have accepted us now. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so you're going, so... You have the Underground Railroad that came out, and it's so historic, and magical realism. It's got so much stuff. And people are going to look at Zola as so Gen Z with the social media speak and, you know, the, the subject matter and things like that. Um, but it's still just as important, mm -hmm. right? Um, so 
Um, what what, are, what do you say to people who are like, okay, how do you go from this historic underground railroad thing to this, to, to Zola and, <laughs> you know, the yeah. sex workers and things like that, which is, I mean, I love, like I said, I love the film, love everything, but how yeah. did you go from there to there or, you know, whichever way you had to go? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because I know, like, you know, I, you know, I count myself as a very fortunate editor to be able to work with such talented directors like Barry Jenkins and Janik Bravo. And, you know, it's so interesting because I think both of them, even though their projects may seem so different, they're very similar in their approach. Both of them are very focused, very nuanced, very detail oriented. And you'll see that the worlds that they create, not only do they feel authentic and fully realized, but they feel purposeful. And I think, you know, with Janixa and um, Zola and Barry with Underground, they seem like so completely different. But if you take a look at it, it's black people and how they're dealing with their trauma, you know? And, you know, basically Colson takes the trauma of slavery and is like, oh, you know, this was a traumatic time in our history, but I'm gonna add it, this fantasy element, this escapism where you can go underground and it can take you away, you know? And I feel like with Zola, based on a, a real life Twitter thread, I think she, the, the, the two, I think it's like 72 hours that she is on this trip. You know, I think a lot of people laughed at it. They couldn't believe it. But underneath, there's this young girl who was almost taken away. And, you know, in, in um, you know, sex trafficking, never to be heard of again. And I think that's a really, really big issue in America that a lot of people aren't talking about are these, you know, these girl, these um, young girls of color who are disappearing and, you know, daily and never to be heard of again. And I think, you know, Zola, although it's fun and, you know, you're laughing and you know, the music, dancing underneath, it's like, oh, this is her processing her trauma through something that was actually a very dangerous situation. Um, so there, there is a, you know, there is a comparison in these storylines, even though they feel completely different. And I think um, me as an editor working with these, you know, super talented directors, you have to get the world right. Because if you don't, if you don't, there's a precision in storytelling that if you don't get it right, it feels like a gimmick or it's almost, you know, it's almost too comical or too unbelievable. But I think the, the, the language and the, the editing of Zola, we had to get it right. And we had to present it in a way where you look at it and you're like, oh, this is still art. This story is still important. And I think the takeaway from this is, you know, parents and, you know, young kids, be careful who you're jumping in a car with, <laughs> you know, just because you see someone on social media, they sound nice, they're cool, like, oh, we're friends. No, no, no. Like, you don't know who these people are. Um, and I think that's one of the dangers of social media is because you can interact so quickly with someone, you feel like you know them. It's like you've never met them in person. You don't know where they come from. And so it's definitely a cautionary tale of what, you know, these social media interactions can, you know, lead to. Thank you. And that is so true. I remember the scene, uh, that moment where she's like, you, you know, you did this to me. You knew this was happening. And they had this real conversation. And it's like, oh, you know, that's when the laughter stopped. And that's when everything yeah. got real, real. Um, so you really, you really hit it out the park with oh, that one too. That's so. a, yeah, that's what someone, you know, one of the, when we were at Sundance, one woman commented, she, I think she works with, um, you know, trying to caution girls from the possibility of, you know, being taken. And she says that oftentimes it's someone you, it's either a family member or a friend who gets you into these situations. And I don't think a lot of people, know that you know so I think it's a it's definitely something to keep your guard up and you know only be around people that you trust so you you know definitely don't have to go down that road so yeah thank you thank you so You're much welcome.